good afternoon. my name is jj spoon and i'm an associate professor of political science and director of the center for european studies at the university of pittsburgh for today's conversation on europe. we will be discussing the upcoming elections to the european parliament today's conversation is sponsored by the european studies center and the university center for international studies our co-sponsors who are joining us remotely are the jean monnet center of excellence at florida international university and the european union center at the U university of illinois urbana champaign wanted to thank you uh send a thank you to my colleague iris Matievich um, for her help in organizing today's event on may 23rd to 26th over 5 million 500 million citizens in the 28 member states of the european union will head to the polls to elect as of now, 751 representatives to the European Parliament, the only directly elected body in the EU. This will be the ninth election to the EP since direct elections began in 1979. The distribution of seats per member state varies by country size. In 2014, Germany sent the largest delegation to Brussels, which was 96 members of the European Parliament, and smaller states such as Estonia, Cyprus, Malta, and Luxembourg sent the smallest delegations of only six MEPs. In these elections, voters vote for their national parties, which then join cross-national party groups of similar parties. In the outgoing parliament elected in 2014, the European People's Party, the party which brings together many center-right, conservative, and Christian Democratic parties, held the most seats, and the Socialists and Democrats, a party group which brings together many socialist and social democratic parties, um, was the second largest group. Um, of particular interest um, to, to many are that smaller parties um, from on both the right and the left hold about 25% of the seats. Turnout in elections to the European Parliament has traditionally been lower than in national elections, as these elections suffer from the challenges of what are called second order elections, something our panelists will discuss further uh, today. Uh, in 2014, the average turnout was only 42.6%. This year's elections take place in the context of rising support for right wing populist parties and the ongoing Brexit negotiations. To help us understand these upcoming elections and what's at stake, we are joined by a panel of experts. Uh, our first expert is Catherine de Vries, uh, who is a Westerdijk Chair and Professor of Political Behavior in Europe in the Department of Political Science and Public Administration at the Free University of Amsterdam, where she also received her PhD. She serves as the co-director of the VU Interdisciplinary Center for European Studies. Previously, she held positions at the University of Oxford, University of Essex, and University of Geneva. In 2014, Catherine received the American Political Science Association Emerging Scholar Award for her contribution to the fields of elections, public opinion, and voting behavior. Catherine's work focuses on Euroscepticism and the European Union, political change in Europe, and the rise of challenger parties, political corruption, as well as remittances and migration. Her work has appeared in leading political science journals, such as the American Political Science Review, Annual Review of Political Science, and the Journal of Politics. Her recent book, Euroscepticism and the Future of European Integration, published by Oxford University Press, received the European Union Studies Association Best Book in the EU Studies Award in 2019. Catherine is also a scientific advisor for Upinions, and an independent platform for Euro European public opinion funded by the Bertelsmann Foundation. Welcome, Catherine. Thank you. Uh, we also have uh, Matthias uh, Rudin, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Political Science at the University of Amsterdam, where he also received his PhD. He previously held positions at Utrecht University and the Amsterdam Institute for Inequality Studies of the University of Amsterdam. His research focuses on the causes and consequences of populism and radicalism, and has appeared in many political science journals, including the European Journal of Political Research, Comparative Political Studies, European Union Politics, Party Politics, and Electoral Studies. He is co-editor of Radical Right Wing Populist Parties in Western Europe, published by Rutledge. Matthias is co-director of the Hot Politics Lab, an interdisciplinary research group combining experiments, physiological measurement, and automated text analysis to analyze the role of emotions, personality, and language in politics. He is also the initiator of the Populist, an international research collaboration which offers academics and journalists an overview of populist, far right, far left, and Eurosceptic parties in Europe. Uh, welcome, Matthias. And then we uh, are joined uh, uh, as well by Andrea Aldrich, who is a lecturer in the Department of Political Science at Yale University. She received her PhD from the University of Pittsburgh. She previously held positions at the University of Houston and the University of Chicago. Her research focuses on political representation and comparative political institutions, with a particular interest in the influence of internal party organization on gender equality in elections and political parties and democratic representation in Eastern Europe 
and the European Union. While she completing her PhD, she conducted field work as a Fulbright scholar in Zagreb, Croatia. Her work has been published in the Journal of Common Market Studies, Party Politics, and Politics and Gender. Andrea is currently working on a book project entitled National Parties and European Legislators, The Consequences of Party Organization for the European Parliament. So welcome, Andrea, and thank you all for joining us. Uh, so we have lots to talk about, um, so we'll, we'll get started. Um, so Catherine, I was hoping you could um, sort of start us off by giving um, some discussion of these second order elections in, in general and what voting patterns in these elections look like. Yeah, so I think the kind of easy way to think about it is that they're midterm elections like you have in the US. So you have congressional election are going to be less important than presidential election because it's not necessarily an executive that's at stake. But it's not maybe entirely correct because what you have in the European Union is basically a combination of directly elected institutions and indirectly elected institutions. So institutions that are elected by voters, uh, European voters in different kind of national election campaign so it's not even a europe wide election like you have in the, like you would have in the us a year us wide so there are dutch elections in in there are dutch european parliamentary election in the netherlands and there's german european parliamentary elections in germany and they're held also on different days so in that way it's not entirely the same thing as a as a um, as a um, midterm election in the US. But they do have a lot of the characteristics of a, of a midterm election in the US. So, for example, government parties tend to lose, opposition parties tend to gain, uh, people tend to vote with the heart rather than with the head, i.e. they're less likely to vote strategically, but more likely to give a sincere preference, and also turnout is lower than in elections where there is a government at stake at the end. Great, um, thank you. Um, so we know, as I mentioned before, that um, you know turnout tends to be lower in these elections. So you know, as part of this sort of second order election phenomenon, why are citizens, you know, do citizens tend to vote less in these elections? Um, so, um, yeah. Go oh, ahead. yeah. No, sorry. Yeah, I, I can. Yeah. So, yeah. so if you think about if you think about the kind of EU system uh, or European system, where you have majority of, of the systems are parliamentary systems, or in some ways a combination of a presidential election and a parliamentary election, like you have in France, is that in these kind of parliamentary elections, normally in the Netherlands or in Germany or also in Britain, these elections are important because the government comes out at the end. So the parties that get the majority in in Parliament or or are together form a majority if they're if it's a coalition uh, uh, party uh, uh, or sorry a co coalition government tend to then be members of the government and also uh, be ministers of that government uh, so in the european parliamentary elections is different the 2014 election was actually different than years before so you had the spitzenkandidat and i think we're going to talk about that uh, later on so I'll, I'll leave it for now but the leader of the biggest party group uh, becomes is, is allowed to set his own set team if you will for the commission but the but the 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 actual rep, the actual kind of electoral strength of the different party groups in the European Parliament is not going to be a reflection of the ideological slant, if you will, of commissioners. So the way commissioners come into being is that they, the team is, really has to be approved by the European Council, where the heads of state are in. So most likely you're going to see kind of a, a candidate that the, that the government at that moment in time in the Netherlands or in Germany or in Sweden or, or in Italy can agree on, and that person becomes the commissioner of that particular country. So you have some bearing of these elections on who becomes the commissioner, but not really. So that, mean, that means that for many people, they're not really sure what's at stake in European parliamentary elections, because it's not the main legislature in the European Union, or it's at least only a co-legislature, and the bearing or the ideological slant of that parliament is not necessarily going to be reflected in the commission. So people are kind of like, well, you know, what's up? What am, why, am I, why do I need to vote here? And, and, and what's going to be, is my vote at all going to be instrumental? And we think in political science that the degree to which you think a vote is instrumental uh, for the outcome of, uh, of an election vis-a-vis -vis either how the parliament looks like or the government is, that's going to be formed afterwards, that people are more likely to vote when they think that their vote's going to be more instrumental. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, um, Andrea, I know you've done um, quite a bit of research in, in sort of among the new member states, and we know that turnout, although, as I mentioned before, is low across, across the board, is even lower. In many in many of these countries, um, a couple of numbers that always stand out to me what it, it are in Slovenia and Croatia, for example, in 2014, Slovenia 25% of voters voted, and in uh, uh, excuse me, Croatia 25% of voters voted. In Slovakia, it was 13%. Um, 
um, which even by U.S. standards is quite low. Um, and so I was uh, I was wondering if you know if you have some thoughts as to you know sort of why that is, and if you're if you think that that sort of low turnout numbers are going to continue in, in in this upcoming election. Yeah, well, I think uh, there are several reasons why we might think turnout is lower. Um, that are similar across both Eastern and Western Europe, but then some that are specific to Eastern Europe. So again, it's this idea that the elections maybe are not very important, uh, that citizens don't really know what's at stake. Um, and there's been some criticism lodged against uh, the media, I know, especially in Croatia, that like they don't really pay enough attention to it and don't give enough information to voters to really get them um, out there and motivate them to vote. Um, another one of the reasons, um, particularly with Slovakia and why people might not be voting is that um, there's a little bit of blame, I guess, put on the party system itself, that these are newer, younger party systems, and there aren't as many people that are uh, loyal um, and active voters for each particular party. So when a European election comes around, you don't have the same uh, large base that is mobilized to go and vote uh, in a particular election that you might have um, in some more established systems. Um, there's also a lot of new parties that tend to come up in the European elections, and then those don't have a base really at all that's going to mobilize to vote for them. Um, in Slovenia, which is uh, the lowest uh, of all of the countries in the last election, um, it was also said that election fatigue might have played a role. Um, the European election came just a few months after a two-round presidential election, uh, which was very important for, uh, for um, or not Slovenia, sorry, Slovakia. So uh, that could also be a reason. Um, but then I think like one of the things that I've noticed, uh, especially in Croatia, is something that I might, this is a term like I completely made up, but uh, it might be like elite fatigue. Um, so this low uh, election turnout in Croatia is similar to just a trend of lower turnout overall uh, in all of the elections in Croatia over the last um, eight to ten years. Um, and so I know, especially during the, the very first European election, which I was doing my field work for, a lot of people were really um, sort of turned off with those people who were running for the European Parliament because it was seen as a very much an elite position to have. Um, and there was a lot of discussion in the press about how the salaries are so high for the members of the European Parliament. And so that the people who were running for office were seeking sort of this uh, nice, fancy job in Brussels. There was some criticism against the candidates about um, how they were going to move their families to Brussels to educate their, their children in Brussels and, Brussels and kind of leave Croatia. Um, and I think that is something that is unique to Eastern Europe in a sense because the salaries are a lot higher for members of the European Parliament. Um, in Croatia in particular, the MPs, the national parliamentarians, already sort of um, are seen as too elite because their salaries are more than three times the national average. But a member of the European Parliament makes almost ten times the nas national average. So I think this might have something to do with it as well. Um, mm -hmm. This is just my opinion. Though, I think, I don't know. <laughs> no, no, of course. Um, and I think it's you know especially interesting, right? Is that, you know, especially in, you know in the case of Croatia that recently joined, and some of these other countries that joined you know, fairly recently with Eastern expansion that, you know, uh, that there was obviously a real desire um, or at least perceived desire to join and now sort of the struggle of, of, of what comes from that. Um, do you have a sense that turnout is going to continue to be low or in, in the upcoming elections or? Um, I would think so, that it's probably going to be similar to what it's been in the past. Um, especially in Croatia, it might be slightly higher. Um, because they had an election, you know, when they joined in 2013, and then another one right away in 2014. So it's sort of been a while, um, and there are some things going on in the national politics that might lead people to get out and vote uh, for these second order reasons that Catherine had mentioned. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I doubt it's going to be much higher than it was last time. Sure. Um, <laughs> <laughs> even well, given the trend, that even in their not, they've had some pretty contentious national elections, and even voting in those elections has been down from what it's been in previous years. Yeah, so that seems like much more of a sort of systemic, systemic issue. But I suppose anything higher than thirteen percent would be, you know, a move in the right direction. Yeah, I, <laughs> they probably don't want to be last. They'll probably be embarrassed if they're last. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so I was hoping we could now talk a bit about, um, you know, what when voters are going to the polls, right? And, and I mentioned, you know, the voting will take place over three days. Um, what, you know, what are voters really? Thinking about when they when they're when they're going to vote, are they thinking about national issues? Um, as we know, that that tends to be what is the case in um, in second order elections, or, um, or what other sorts of things are kind of on their minds. Um, Matthias, I was wondering if you could um, kind of jump in and, and give your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think these elections are the, the, the main story, or one of the main stories, is going to be going to be about the success of the populist radical right, and I think. 
um, the main reasons why these parties are so successful is uh, uh, that the issues that they think are very important, that they find important, that they emphasize, that they are issue owner of, these issues are incre increasingly important. Well, they were important 10 years ago as well, but they're still high on the political agenda. And their success, again, makes these issues, issues even more important. And you get a spiral of issue attention, attention for those parties. And I think the main issues that are high on the agenda right now uh, for these parties, but also for many people, is um, uh, national identity, traditions uh, uh, in a country, uh, immigration, of course, of course, which is closely related. And also, what is not re really an issue, but anti-establishment politics is really important. Something like what Andrea called elite fatigue. Um, and I, I, I really like that, that term. I think it's, um, it's high on the, on, on the agenda right now in basically every country. And it's, it is a national issue, so it's about the national elites, but it's also a European issue, of course. And then it also is closely related to Euroscepticism. Euroscepticism can, and, and Catherine knows much more about it, but can have many different elements, many different aspects. It can be about national identity, it can be about immigration, but it can also be about resistance to the uh, political establishment, the, the, the elite in Brussels that does, doesn't listen to ordinary citizens, for instance. Um, so I think that these, especially for those populist radical right parties, this combination of a focus on uh, issues of nationalism, national identity, combined with a populist message uh, uh, that is negative about the elite, that that is really fruitful for these parties and that is also something that you can see um, is really important in many of the European member states. And I think that the, the populist radical right parties also try to connect other issues to these issues. And one important example I think is the climate change issue which has become in my country the Netherlands increasingly important in the last couple of months I would even say but you could also see that that's the case in, in, in for instance Finland or other countries in, in, in Europe mm -hmm. yeah no, thank you um, so I wonder we'll get back Oh, yeah, Can I jump yeah, in yeah. one thing? Yeah, so because I, I, sure. I very much agree with, uh, with, with what Matthijs is saying, and I think also one thing is that we keep forgetting, and that's also a bit maybe the academic literature on, on kind of second order, or, and, and I think we've all contributed to that because we want to get cited and make our point that, you know, it's then it's about the EU and then it's not. But actually, you know, people who, who, who negotiate in the council, and the council has become really important, and it's become increasingly important in the, in the kind of crises that, that JJ mentioned at the beginning, so Eurozone, uh, migration crisis, so a lot of stuff going on in, in the EU, then these national politicians are European politicians, right? I mean, they're, they're deciding the course of European integration, so it's increasingly very difficult in this multi-level system to contain anything, and it's going from one side to the other. And I think for the reasons that Matthias very outlined, and actually and Andrea as well, in the sense that, that um, these issues that are these kind of anti- anti-establishment um, politicians that are trying to also kind of, you know, reap the electoral benefits of, of, of anti-establishment sentiment is that, that for them the EU is like, a, is like a double whammy, right? It's like a perfect scapegoat. It's a technocratic institution that is responsible for free movement of people, that has opened the markets, that is so for a left-wing populist, for a right-wing populist, for even a mainstream party that's wary of the EU, there's so many possibilities that you can frame this amorph, you know, project into your own electoral benefits. So it's like a perfect scapegoat. scapegoat. And only now I think that we're seeing that there's a, that there's a clear pushback in someone like Macron who's trying to provide the other side, so who's actually trying and, and that also is, of course, totally to his national benefit because he wants to be the anti-Le Pen. So how can you be the anti-Le Pen by saying you're pro-supranationalism and she's pro-liberal for intergovernmentalism? So it's, again, also these national incentives that, prob you know, beyond that he might have ideological reasons to, to have those positions, but it's clearly also in his strategic national interest to portray himself as that type of leader because it actually whoops up the kind of votes of, of the more cosmopolitan uh, French uh, French electorate. So to really talk about something being second order or European or, or you know, I think you know some of the work might, we kind of have beyond we're, we're beyond that I guess in some ways where these things have become so intertwined that it's very difficult to say where Europe stops, where it ends, and it's and and where national borders end and where where national politics ends, right? So so in this election will be interesting. Is one last thing. This election will be interesting, but because at least the media, I don't know if people 
you know, maybe we're all too much in our Twitter bubbles, but now the media might, might be framing, trying to frame this into a kind of Salvini versus Macron, right? So the renationalization of Europe and, and, you know, with Brexit, these Eurosceptic parties not wanting to leave, but like a Remain skepticism where they, where they trying to mold the EU to their favor. And then Macron putting forward this opposite of a European renaissance and trying to create this reform program. And that's the first time where maybe we've really seen that this type of horse race media frame uh, is also pro anti-EU. I personally find it very, very sad that there's not a debate about what Europe we want, but it's just like a, which blood group you are, you're in or out. So it's not a lot of nuance, but at least there is a discussion much more about, you know, what kind of future of Europe do you see? And then it's, yeah, really a type of populist right uh, wing framing that 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 Matthias was, was was talking about in a more cosmopolitan, you know, more pro elite type of framing of uh, of Macron. Mm -hmm. And I think that's actually really interesting because we've gotten past uh, Catherine, as you just alluded to, sort of discussions of European issues versus national issues, and what you know our voters thinking about Europe when they go and vote. And in a way, as you said, everything has become so, so much more sort of intertwined. And one could say that you know that means that the Europe the Europe project has moved that far ahead that we really have kind of intertwined national politics with European politics. And so while the, the debate may not necessarily be you know favorable to Europe in all in all circles, and quite the opposite. The fact that it is about Europe, one could argue that we've sort of made some progress in that um, in that sort of difference between sort of national and European politics. Um, so that could possibly be from sort of those the the Europeanists among us, you know, that that actually has there's been some 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 positive that have come out of that a bit, I suppose. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit, um, you know, about kind of polarization, right? This is something that we, you know, talk a lot about, obviously, of course, in the U.S. context, but has become increasingly part of the conversation in in the European context. In other words, really, where we see electorates very much polarized, you know, on sort of one side of the issue over the other. We talk about right wing populists, left left wing populists, whether it's you know on issues of immigration or climate change is. is as Matthias has brought up, that's become part of this conversation as well. Um, and I was wondering, um, you know, if whoever wants to kind of jump in on this to talk about kind of uh, observations about sort of this this degree of polarization and how we're seeing this kind of play out um, in in the European in the European elections. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, I think that when it comes to voting behavior, that we see pretty well that there is increasing polarization in in, in quite some countries. For instance, if you look at France. Uh, where you had Macron versus Le Pen, right? It was really what Catherine also said. It's like the the the, the one end uh, uh, when it comes to uh, the cultural division uh, against the other one. So so the radical right versus more like pro Europe, pro immigration, etc. We also saw the same thing happening in Austria to quite some extent uh, during the presidential elections. Right there, uh, we saw it during the Finnish elections. Uh, uh, right now, the, the Dutch elections, uh, which in, in which the Green Party was pretty successful, but also the radical right. So we can see that when it comes to voting, um, that the electorate is pretty polarized when it comes to cultural issues, European integration, immigration. Of course, these issues also have economic components, but they're mostly framed in the current debate in a cultural way. So when you look at actual voting behavior, I think there's quite some polarization. However, when you look at public opinion, things are less clear, I would say. So it's not the case that when you look at, 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 at public opinion, ideas about uh, immigration, for instance, that you can see that the, that, 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 that the ideas about immigration have become increasingly polarized, have become polarized, for instance, when you look at different educational groups or whatever you look at. It's not really clear that there is inc increasing polarization when it comes to actual ideas about about substantive topics. However, when it comes to voting behavior, I would say that there is increasing polarization. And this is also true, I think, uh, when you look at the level of parties. So parties also are increasingly uh, um, divided on these mostly cultural issues. Mm -hmm. And you know, we could say that you know, when we we know from you know from research that the you know polarization drives turnout, right? So the more sort of polarized the, the electorate may be, right? People see real differences in what's on offer. So that may, right? We, we may see that that could have the, the sort of effect of increasing turnout, perhaps in certain countries where we see um, polarization. But that obviously also leads to you know something that Catherine mentioned.
the support for all of the more extreme parties that we tend to see as well, right? Which we see anyway because of the, the nature of the European, the EP elections, but because we're seeing this polarization and, and you know, in certain places where we really see support for sort of the, the, the populist left, the populist right, that that could lead to kind of an increase in support for those parties as well. Um, and we'll get back to kind of predictions for what outcomes look like um, kind of later in the discussion. Um, so, um, why don't we maybe spend some time um, and, and, and uh, um, whoever, Catherine, you can start and then everyone else can kind of jump in talking about Euroscepticism um, in particular, because that is obviously something that's very much at the heart of um, kind of the discussion about Europe these days. And, and, and um, obviously you have, um, have all sorts of really interesting um, public opinion data on this um, in, in your recent book. So I was wondering if you could kind of, you know, kind of sketch out a bit what we know about sort of Euroscepticism more generally, and then we can talk about how it is going to play out in these upcoming elections. So I, I think that it alluded a little bit to what was said before. So I think traditionally the idea was that, uh, and that's actually um, a great work by Matt Gabel, which is, you know, almost a little bit more than 20 years ago. So in that way that we're revising it, it's maybe not entirely surprising given what you were saying, JJ, about how the EU has also changed as an object. But for a long time, we kind of thought that your skepticism has has um, very much economic roots. So it has to do with skill competition. It has to do with the degree to which you benefit from the internal market. It has to do with uh, your pocketbook and the, and how well your country is doing. And the ideas would be that the better off are going to be more likely to pr to support the EU, and the worse off are going to be more more uh, Euroskeptic. And and we still find some evidence for that if you think about at aggregate how the Brexit vote went, right? So uh, that you see more deprived areas having larger leave margins than uh, than than wealthier areas. But we also see that in that actually maybe just take that Brexit example as an illustration that there are other concerns that are coming up. So that's something that was been alluded to is the fact that we have free movement of people and that free movement of people, of course, is going pretty one directional because it's going from st some states that are more struggling uh, to develop themselves economically and that are struggling in terms of good governance to more the richer countries uh, where there's more employment. Right. I mean, migrants are not going to places where there's not a lot of employment. So in those countries, there's also a lot of kind of, you know, ideas about a hey, labor market competition or also cultural values of, you know, who are these people and are they, and are those people that, that I would want to work with? And are they threatening national identity and national sovereignty? And so um, um, that was the very much the kind of uh, revisionist of a more identity type or cultural type of explanations uh, um, uh, that have been uh, developed. And, and recently, I've been trying to also think about, well, what we said before is the fact that maybe it's not so easy to just think that, that people's opinions about the EU are only about the EU. Because both of those kind of explanations are about, well, they're, free mar they're about free m movement and they're about the free market. They're about things that the EU does. Those are going to be surely going to be important, but maybe people are also just, you know, affected by the way that they think about the EU by what they find at home. So, for example, if you take exa exactly that example again of the Brexit vote that many people in Britain thought and, and maybe still think, at least you saw the discussion about no deal, that, you know, their country had a viable exit option, that they could leave and that would be viable and that the current conditions they're extrapolating into the future will be fine It's Britain. Whereas for, I know that there's some Spanish people also in the room, but for example, in Spain, uh, I remember Zapatero also saying early on, oh, we're in the Champions League of Europe, right? So they really saw that it was a homecoming of their country in the heart of Europe, and they actually think that maybe they're better off in the European Union than they would be outside. So what you actually saw in the recent period is that actually in countries that were kind of bailout battered, like Spain, you you know, Spain has the highest level of support for the EU. You know, parties like Podemos type of tried a little bit of you know, anti-austerity, and it had a little bit of traction, but they, you know, uh, not even the very right-wing populists that are coming up now, Vox is particularly Eurosceptic. It's just not a vote winner in Spain. And that has to do with the fact that they really think that the EU is a lifeboat for them and has gives them benefits further on. But for an, av an average Dutch person, I'm just looking at Matthijs, you'll have something to say to say about this, but we have a, a new version. The Dutch always have another version of right-wing populism. So we have a new version of that lately. Uh, which is called Forum for Democracy, and this is one of the most Eurosceptic uh, positions uh, of late. He's not necessarily any more for exit, but he's very strongly uh, anti-EU and much more vocal about this. Uh, wrote his PhD, actually, on Europe, very negative 
uh, perspective on, on, on Europe. But within the, within the Dutch uh, arena, it's this idea that, well, you know, Britain might be leaving, we might need to contribute more. Um, what are we actually benefiting from this union? Isn't it dragging us down? We're paying for, I'm not saying that this is all correct, right? But I'm just saying that these are perceptions. And in that way, I've kind of described it as this is this, it's this kind of tree, you know, that, that has given a lot of benefits to European, to, to many also wealthy European countries. And they've been picking the fruits, but they actually think now with having these fruits that they don't need a tree anymore. And this is a kind of a little bit what is, what is starting to happen, that people are questioning what the benefits of that are. And then you get this paradoxical relationship uh, kind of finding that actually in countries that do relatively well, you see much more Euroscepticism developing than in countries that do relatively worse. And that probably also has to do with what they think the EU can provide for them. But that is, of course, not only a story about the EU, that's also a story about what people think their national systems could, could give them alone or, or more independent. So in that way, your skepticism, as the EU has developed from a market to free movement of people, now to a much more mixed system that we discussed, also the nature of your skepticism, I think, has just changed over course, and, and, and other explanations might be more prominent today than were prominent earlier on when, for example, Matt Gabel was writing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Matthias, do you want to jump in and talk more about the Netherlands, or just more generally, kind of some ideas as well, respond to Catherine's... Uh... Yeah, I think, I mean, what you can see if you look at uh, Forum for Democracy, it's pretty, in, well, in, when you look at the Netherlands in general, what is pretty interesting is that um, the European Union is an important issue for, well, in particular, radical right parties, but also green parties, uh, social liberal parties. They have the opposite ideas about the European Union, of course. But it has never been one of the central issues for these parties. Uh, so it's really important, but it has never been, well, it has once been central for Geert Wilders, uh, the, the, the leader of the, um, uh, of, of the PVV, the, 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 well, not anymore the most uh, successful populist radical right party in the Netherlands, but previously. Um, and he once tried to make it the central issue uh, during a, a national election campaign, but that really didn't work. People don't think that the issue didn't think back then that the issue of European integration was important enough to be the, well, the, 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 the central thing for the elections. Uh, and that right now, I think Thierry Baudet strongly emphasizes, the leader of Forum for Democracy that Catherine talked about, he strongly emphasizes uh, uh, um, European integration and he's really strongly uh, against European integration. He has written lots of columns, books even, uh, uh, about his Eurosceptic uh, uh, ideas about Europe, but um, it was not it was not the most central issue in his election campaign. And what is really interesting, you can see right now that he is not in favor, as Catherine said already, he's not in favor of uh, uh, Nexit anymore. Um, and I think uh, uh, because for him other things are more important right now. It's more about national identity, which is of course related to Euroscepticism, but more about immigration, more about uh, anti-establishment politics, and more about climate change. Um, so what is interesting, what is interesting, I'm not really sure what is going to happen now, because these next elections are of course about Europe. So it might be the case that he will emphasize the issue more strongly than he did before. Mm -hmm. So Andrea, I was wondering if you could um, kind of jump in and, and give the perspective um, as well um, on in some of these southern European countries from the Euro, you know, the Euroskeptic perspective, what the debate is around some of these issues as well. Yeah, so I think um, when we think more southeast, well, southeastern Europe in particular, um, there was this this feeling when, especially when Croatia joined the European Union, uh, the European Union, that it was just this return to Europe, like we've always been European and now we get to go back um, and show that that this is, a, it, in fact, where we belong, and this idea that all of these great economic benefits would come from it. But this happened sort of at the same time as the immigration crisis like, really ramped up. And a lot, um, as we know, a lot of, of immigrants came through Croatia and came through the Balkans. So it, it very quickly changed kind of the story about what the European Union is doing for Croatia uh, in, the, in um, the Western Balkans. And so one of the issues that's um, come up now in the debate is less about uh, what are the economic benefits that we're getting from being members of the European Union and what is it doing for me, but more what kind of um, restrictions is it putting on us as far as our own ideas about border security, um, our own ideas about protecting our national interest and sort of the culture um, that had traditionally been there. And then there's also a lot of uncertainty now 
um, especially with Brexit, which I know we're going to talk about a little bit later, about what the future of the European Union is going to be in the Western Balkans. Um, so I know at least in Croatia, citizens had thought that once they joined, they would be able to kind of control the relationship between the European Union and some of their bordering countries, but they've lost a little bit of that control just given, you know, the, uh, all of the immigration the events that have kind of transpired since 2013. Um, so a lot of the sort of the right-wing parties there are, are kind of bringing the debate sort of back to, is the European Union even democratic? Uh, is it taking away too much of our national sovereignty? Uh, is it making us uh, sort of commit to reforms that society is not ready to make, be these in terms of gender equality or um, uh, like LBG, LB, <laughs> gay rights and gay marriage and things that like a mouthful here. Um, and so it's, so it's all of these things that have been mentioned that are more cultural, I think, than, than mm -hmm. traditional conceptions of Euroscepticism. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I think this is a, you know sort of really interesting that we've sort of seen this evolution of Euroscepticism um, that you've all that you've all talked about, and we're almost on sort of the second wave of populist parties in some places, which is also somewhat interesting. And, and, and obviously, the Netherlands kind of uh, maybe the best example of that. Um, Matthias, I was wondering if you could uh, maybe start us off talking a bit about kind of the attraction to these populist parties, whether you know I guess the first wave or the second wave, but you know really what what is it about these parties? And I think. It's it's much it's much more complicated than perhaps uh, on the surface um, because as we've talked about you've mentioned um, obviously uh, populist parties especially in the Netherlands bringing in the climate change issue this is the anti elitism right so it's we're sort of covering a lot of these parties are covering a lot of issues and not just kind of the the the, the anti immigration issue which is how many of them got started um, so so I, I wonder if you could just sort of give us some sense to start of, of what's the attraction to these to these parties especially in these elections. Yeah, so I think when we, what is really important when we talk about populism, it's really important that we make a distinction between left-wing and right-wing populism or radical left-wing and radical right-wing populism because um, they have something in common, their populism, they have more in common, Euroscepticism, different types of Euroscepticism though, but they um, strongly differ from each other when it comes to their main ideology and people mainly vote for these parties because of their main ideologies. So what we see right now, uh, the, the, the polls tell us that populist parties will be increasingly successful, uh, that they will be pretty successful after these elections and right now uh, uh, as well. Um, but this is mainly due to the populist radical right parties and not so much due to the populist radical left parties. If you look, for instance, at parties like Syriza in Greece, Podemos in Spain, the Socialist Party in the Netherlands, these parties are not performing that well. If we look at the Five Star Movement, which is neither radical right nor uh, radical left, but it is populist, this party is not performing that well. The parties that are, that are doing really well are the populist radical right ones. Uh, in particular, in, uh, we will have uh, the AFD in Germany that will, that will be in the European Parliament, Fox in Spain. We have uh, the Lega, which is uh, increasingly popular in Italy. Um, so these parties are really going to make a change. Uh, according to the polls right now, populist radical right parties will be probably twice as successful, maybe a bit less, 1.5 times as successful as they, are, as they were during the previous European election. So that's a big win. And five years ago, they were already, well, the, 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 uh, the elections were described as an earthquake because of the electoral gains of the populist radical right. So this time, the, 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 there will be even heavier uh, uh, shakes in the ground, so to say. And this time it's not unexpected. The previous time it was not unexpected either. But these parties are going to win. And of course, the question is why? And I think that populism is one part of the answer, but I think there's much more. Uh, and the other things I've already talk talked about them are national identity uh, combined with populism. And then you get some, yeah, well, and then the, the, the European Union, of course, is what Catherine uh, said, the perfect scapegoat, the combination of the two. Uh, climate change is one of the things, but also, for instance, uh, um, uh, when it comes to law and order, when it comes to terrorism, when it comes to safety, those issues are really important for these, uh, for these parties. And it seems as if they are, uh, all of them are really gaining right now. Not all of them, but most of them are. Mm -hmm. 
and you know, and, and as we know, the, the sort of mainstream parties are kind of in this a bit of a you know bind in the sense of do they you know what what do, do they respond to these to these issues? Do, these, do they respond to these parties or or not? Right? We know that this is something that is uh, a lot of researchers are looking at right now, and, and and we're still trying to figure out you know the best way to you know some, some may say sort of contain the uh, these parties. Um, so before we uh, move on to uh, Brexit, which we should should talk some about, I wanted to see. If there were any questions um, either here or by, from anyone joining us remotely. Yeah. Oh, just a quick question about what you just said, Matthias. Um, compare, you know, discussing how the radical left has not been as successful compared to the radical right. Um, I was wondering, is would you say that that's primarily due to the fact that there are just more parties on the left? So we know that the Green parties have been more su successful. Is that so voters are just shifting to the number of different left parties that there are compared to the right, which traditionally only has, you know, a Christian Democratic Party and then maybe a Nationalist Party, but now we're starting to see more of these parties kind of pop up on the right, so now they have more options to divert their vote to. Is that the reason or not? I don't know. Just... Well, what I think, what we saw that, I'm, I'm not really sure if this is, a, is this an answer to your question, but what we so that in the aftermath of the of the financial crisis, we saw that the left-wing populist parties, the radical left-wing populist parties, were increasingly successful in many countries. Right. Podemos, uh, uh, CSA as well, and also in Italy. Uh, um, so what was good news for them was the that during the financial crisis and just after the financial crisis, uh, the public debate was about economic issues and not so, much, not so much about cultural issues. And it was good news because these parties really focus on redistribution, on uh, they want to do something about inequality. Um, so it's good if, if, if there's a lot of talk about economic issues. However, right now it's, we have, well, it's not, uh, there's not like a real refugee crisis uh, 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 that is that strongly present anymore. But um, we talk much more about these issues, and that's good news for the populist radical right parties, but also for the green parties, because they, of course, hold the exact opposite opinion uh, when it comes to immigration, when it comes to uh, topics like that. So I think that what we see right now is that we have some left-wing parties that are successful. These are the green parties. These are the parties that are more multiculturalist, more cosmopolitan, uh, and we, see, we can see that some of the more traditional left-wing parties who focus on economic issues are not so successful. These are the radical left-wing populist parties, and these also are the social democratic parties. But of course, that, that's a whole different story because much more is going on there. Um, but I, I do think that what is really important right now is, is, is the salience of the type of issues. And it's not so much about the economy, it's much more about culture. Could I say also that yeah, Catherine. Yeah. yeah. So no, I, I very much agree with what was said, but I think I think two things I wanted to add to that. So that I think also that the that the that the lack of strength of left wing um, of left populist parties is endogenous to a change that many or is very much related or reciprocal to related to what what a lot of radical right parties or radical right populist parties have done. And that what they have done is a strategy that was very much implemented by Le Pen, for example, in France, and that is to be basically pro-national identity and protectionist in social issues. So they have almost, if like my dad's saying about issue ownership, that they have almost gone the, gotten the issue ownership on that particular issue. It's been taken away from the left, and they've been particularly um, successful in framing uh, social democrats and previous old left, if you will, as the sellouts of that, which, you know, arguably, you could say third way, you know, might not be entirely, it, it might be a bit oh, an, an, an exaggeration, but th there might be a reason why they're pointing that out. So that's one. And then secondly, and I think that was alluded to already before, so if you're a left-wing um, party, like Podemos, for example, the message is very ambiguous, right? So they are anti-austerity, but then they say that redistribution in Europe is the solution. And then voters are a bit like, huh? So you, you, you're anti-EU, but you're pro-EU at the same time. And then the other thing is that, for example, you see in, with the Socialist Party in the Netherlands, so they're anti-labor migration because it drives down wages in their understanding, but they're pro-refugees. So then it's like, okay, what's your, what's your position on this? So this, and what we know from a lot of research is these ambiguities, that's not the stuff you win elections with. That's, that's very difficult. So they're a bit in a bound. 
And then I think the last thing is that, that you saw some of these populist left parties because of the reasons that, that, that Matthijs outlined, that they are in, in serious, you know, that they are a bit in trouble and, and it's difficult for them, that either, you know, the Syriza and the Podemos that you mentioned, Syriza has gone in government, they're perceived as, as, as kind of helping the Troika putting some stuff through or having only limited opposition to that. And Podemos, for example, in Spain has gone into an electoral coalition with the communists. So everything that they had that was new, that was populist, that was no, is, is almost, you know, watered down by some of these actions, which you can understand out of party strategy, but it's just not very popular with voters. So I think, you know, the, 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 some of the very strategic moves that the populist right has made has been really detrimental for the populist left in countries where you had both of these scattering at the same time. And, and that's just really, you know, it's been very difficult for them to, 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 to get their message through in these elections. Next to all the things that Matthias outlined that, you know, like that, 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 you know, Spain is growing at the moment. So an anti-austerity platform is not going to be that credible anymore, even though many people are still poor and out of a job, but that's not going to be the main thing. And now it's about, about putting a wall up in the territories that have borders with Morocco, right? So it, there's also a lot of that stuff going on, but I think, to that is also that, that these populist parties among themselves uh, have been kind of fighting over issue ownership of some of these particular elements, especially when it comes to redistribution, redistributive issue, issues that people do care about, but they care about it in combination with something. So with a scapegoat or with a, uh, you know, and, 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 and that seems to be, I mean, it's been said by Kitchell and others, it's a kind of golden formula, right? When you can be kind of protective of, of national identity and be pro-protectionists, then you're really taking quote unquote care of people uh, in the perception. And I, I said, I'm not saying that I agree with those positions. I'm just saying that that's, I think the positions that they are trying to put forward. So we have um, a question uh, from a student at, sorry, <laughs> um, a student at the EU Center um, at Illinois. Um, so I will, I'll read it and whoever wants to jump in. Um, so uh, the, the question is, how does media coverage in Europe of left populist parties compare to that of right populist parties? Um, have the right gotten more attention? I think we've sort of addressed that a bit. Um, and could this relate to sort of the left party's weakness more generally? Um, so I can sort of hop in talking about parties on the left for a little bit. Um, not necessarily left populist parties, but parties that tend, tend to be more on the left. So um, in some of these more fluid party systems that we see in Eastern Europe, where a lot of new parties pop up during European elections, um, this particular one has drawn a lot of really small groups um, forming electoral coalitions or parties on left issues, either whether they're environmental or social issues. And they're not really seen as a th like a threat to traditional parties in any way because they're not expected at all to to, to win any seats or um, uh, gain any yeah gain any seats. But what one of the things they're doing is putting their name out there and bringing the issues sort of back to the agenda because they've been largely ignored, I think. Uh, in some of these countries where the media coverage tends to focus on issues that are more associated with the radical right, like these cultural issues, these um, border security issues, things like that. And this is something that uh, wasn't necessarily the case in the previous elections because there were other parties that were maybe focusing on these issues a little bit more. Um, and so I kind of see that as a way smaller groups of people trying to put it back on the agenda and trying to get the media um, to acknowledge that there are people here who care about these things, even though they're not the most important um, in traditional politics or national politics. Great, thank you. Um, so why don't we jump back in um, and, and, and talk a bit about Brexit, which is, I guess, the proverbial elephant in the living room <laughs> um, in this conversation, um, and, and, and somewhat unavoidable. Um, and obviously, we all sort of are familiar with the context. Um, the, the negotiations are continuing at the moment. Uh, Brexit, uh, the, the, the deadline has been moved to, to the end of October. Uh, the UK will be voting, um, as, as far as I understand it, in the elections. Um, although I, um, that's obviously... If they don't get a deal by the 22nd of May. If they exactly, don't get a deal by the exactly. 22nd of May. If they don't get it exactly, um, but I was wondering if we could kind of talk a bit about you know obviously that 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 in and of itself, which is of course very interesting, but more generally, um, you know how how the negotiations have influenced kind of the 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 rhetoric, the issues, what's in the lead up to the elections. Um, we already mentioned obviously uh, Megxit perhaps is not part of the discussion anymore in the Netherlands, um, but more generally um, this sort of 
tenuous relationship um, with especially that some of the far right parties see um, uh, to Europe. So whoever might want to kind of jump in to start uh, on that. Um, Matthias, perhaps. Matthias. Yeah. Yeah, you can see that what is really interesting, I just, I just read uh, an article uh, about France and there Marine Le Pen is also much more hesitant about being explicitly Eurosceptic. She's not in favor of exiting the, the, the European Union anymore, exiting the Eurozone anymore. Uh, so that's the same thing that I mentioned earlier in, in the Netherlands, right? So uh, uh, Thierry Baudet of the uh, Forum for Democracy, he is much less negative right now. He's not talking about Nexit anymore. So there's no talk about Frexit anymore in France. Um, I think that I'm not really sure. I think we don't know. But I think that the Brexit negotiations have quite some have had quite some effect on these uh, new positions of the most Eurosceptic parties in Europe. That we, would be my my hunch, but I'm not really sure about it. I haven't studied this mm -hmm. systematically mm -hmm. yet. But Catherine sure, maybe sure. has. I'm not sure. Yeah, <laughs> I, I have done it on, on, on public opinion. So we had stuff in the field before and after the, um, the, um, the Brexit referendum. And it's not kind of an experiment, of course, because you could anticipate what would happen. But it nonetheless was, of course, a, a, um, a big surprise. People thought it would be 52, 48 the other way, probably, right? That that the that the UK would remain. And what you do see is that even among arch Eurosceptics, so I often make have made a difference between those who are more prone to think in terms of leaving and those who think in terms of change, and that they might want to change uh, some things that Andrew was talking about, like democracy and regime things, or they might want to change some policies. So let's say the Habermas who wants to change the democracy, and the Farufakis who wants to change the policy. And if you want to put people in those boxes. So definitely this, also this exit skepticism among, among the public has really, really decreased. And so therefore, it's, I think, not surprising that what Matthijs is just outlining, that these political parties think that, and actually Thierry Boudet himself has said it, that he himself is not anti-Nexit. He still thinks it can be a, a success, mm -hmm. but he thinks that people are wary about this. And he's right. I mean, that's what the public opinion polls sh show. So the question is, is it strategic? Is this ideological? Is this a combination of both things? I mean, that's very difficult to know. But what is interesting is in the sense that I actually, um, we do have to be very careful to not uh, confuse the, the, the lack of wanting to exit with uh, a lack of Euroscepticism. So these parties are particularly strong and actually have upped some of their language in the same uh, thing that, 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 um, that, uh, that for example, Matthijs was alluding to, uh, Marine Le Pen suggested for the first time to get rid of the commission. So she's, she's really proposing a kind of intergovernmental Europe and the same as the Lega and you have now these, had these cooperation talks in Milan with, that Salvini has organized with different parties because the problem of course for these parties is that they've never really coordinated properly. So they might be the, the, the large, they might be the second largest group it looks like, but they are not in the same group. So they are not going to be the second largest group because they're in different groups. Uh, sorry, it's my daughter, if you, but anyway, um, is, uh, is uh, not so happy. Um, but the, 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 the Brexit negotiations, I think, are also um, in the long run. So, so what I'm a bit afraid of is that in the short run, they're, in, they're increasing this idea that exit is, is of course, not a, not a very viable thing. And even Brits are reconsidering some of that, right? But in the long run, the, for the EU, it might be actually slightly more problematic because you're going to get these political parties who are actually going to shape a blueprint, another blueprint of what the EU might look like, which is a renationalization of it. So in some ways, if you're, if you're, I'm not saying that I would be, but if you're, a, if you're a Juncker, you might think, oh, that's worse because you're going to get these guys trying to move within institutions and trying to do it, you know, to change it from within. And Tusk, for example, just now I saw had got a grilling today. So the, the leader of the or the council president. A, a real um, a grilling in the European Parliament that they think this extension wasn't good, that this is bleeding into the European parliamentary election. And this is also because some of the Eurosceptic parties are kind of saying, or, or, or mostly those far right populist parties that we're talking about, well, look, you know, the EU is, uh, is kind of a, we have to deal with it because it's some kind of prison, but we have to make the prison better. We have to, you know, like we have to make this institution better. So they're really talking a lot about reform in much more explicit ways. I mean, that also we're just taking from a couple of manifestos, so we need to do some more, you know, in-depth analysis of this. Uh, but Stein von Kessel, who has done, looked a little bit into that, that we clearly know that these parties now, looking at the, 
at their at their kind of they've done a qualitative constant analysis of the of the of the speeches and so on. They've they've, ta they've really toned down in the way that Mat that Matthias is suggesting. So Matthias is spot on without having done that research himself. But that they that they really show that that these exit demands are decreasing, but they are changing it to something else, and morphing it to something else, which might be actually. Andrea, I would really like to hear your thoughts on that. That is actually something that in Eastern Europe might have been brewing already. This idea of changing institutions and, and, and wanting to get a different Europe in some ways. Um, I don't know if there's been much discuss discussion about changing Europe. There is definitely discussion about how democratic Europe is, because it's seen sort of as this extra level of elite control that uh, citizens are even further removed from. And this is this is sort of a problem in, a, in national politics in Eastern Europe that people already feel like they don't have really a say in the governments, so that the governments are run by, by elites. Um, and so these are extra elites. But one of the things that um, has actually come up in this election is sort of Brexit and this idea of what Europe is going to look like in the future has really um, created a lot of uncertainty in these countries. Um, we just had the, uh, the UN ambassador um, from Bulgaria uh, here on campus last week talking about some of the concer security concerns that Bulgaria has with the Eastern Partnership company, uh, countries and what's going on uh, with Ukraine and some of the Russian influences that is coming in, uh, be it through energy pipelines that are coming through Europe, Europe. And so he didn't say that he was worried about Brexit in in any way, but you can tell that this idea about what, what does the future of Europe look like really created a lot of uncertainty. Um, and this is certainly true in the Western Balkans. Uh, before, I would say even you know a couple years ago, it was like Montenegro is on the way for membership. Uh, if Northern Macedonia could solve the name conflict, which uh, which they have, that they would be on the way to this as well. But now it's very uncertain whether that will happen at all because there's other you know other problems that that Europe has to deal with. So I think that's one of the things that we see um, in Eastern Europe right now. I think that's really interesting, um, and uh, you know just this idea that. That while and I think Catherine, as you you, you talked about and, and have written about, that there's this difference between sort of the the leave versus change, um, and I think that that's a really and also sort of the, the change in what Europe will look like, and that that that's actually perhaps more of a I don't for lack of a better term perhaps dangerous kind of outcome of of Brexit in some way because now you have from a from sort of the European perspective right because now you have sort of this desire to sort of change from within, right, to get inside the institutions and as we're seeing sort of, you know, weaken them from within and change them from within as opposed to, you know, what we have seen and what some of these leaders and these parties like Le Pen were advocating two, three years ago, which was let's just leave, you know, leave the institution or leave the EU completely, but now it's trying to kind of whittle it away from within and so that, that uh, you know, can, could have much more detrimental effects. Um, as we're seeing in this election, as, as these parties are, are are obviously polling quite well and, and likely to, to be, um, as you said, of course, perhaps they will have the second uh, highest number of MPs, though not perhaps being in, in the same group itself. Um, so I want to talk perhaps just a bit real quickly about, about the UK. And again, you know, at this point, we're still kind of speculating as we have been for many months. But if the UK is in, and is participating, um, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll go with that sort of hypothetical. Um, what's going to happen? Um, based, what do we know in terms of how's that, how is, um, what's the vote going to look like given the current, the current situation? Um, we know we, now we have a Brexit party. We have obviously um, uh, very, uh, we've split parties. We've, the major parties are split on, on Brexit and, and on sort of uh, support for the European integration more generally. So what are, what are we seeing at least now? what the polls are looking like um, if there is to be an election. Whoever wants to, to kind of jump well, in. Well, it's, it's, yeah, it's, tricky, it's tricky because of the fact that there's so many hypotheticals, you know, and then, sure. you know, it's not at all clear and, and, and some of the things, and there's still this possibility that it wouldn't happen. But I think one thing is, and I think that was also what already uh, Matthijs was alluding to, that uh, it was an earthquake election last time, the European parliamentary election, and one of the biggest earthquake was that the UK, that the UK Independence Party became the largest party in, in the UK. And the reason for that, of course, is, is that it's proportional representation. It's the same system, right, where European parliamentary elections are fought under. It's closed list. It's in, the, in this case, it's closed list uh, PR, proportional representation in the UK. So basically, the seats that, you know, where you normally have first past the post, you have to win a district. Now it's going to look more like a Dutch result. You know, you're going to have a, a percentage of the vote, and that's going to lead into it because 2015 
uh, UK elections, UKIP didn't get really any seats. I mean, only of a defector from, from the Conservatives, but they actually were the third largest party, right? So this, this was not really channeled in through the system. So now you're going to see that. So that's what with UKIP. Now, uh, you know, Nigel Farage has set up his Brexit party with previous uh, uh, Conservatives, Tories that have defected. Uh, then you have Change UK, so that's uh, that's the group around Anna Sudbury and um, uh, and and others. Uh, she's a defector from the Conservatives and a Remainer, and she wants a referendum, and that's what they are proposing. Then you have, uh, of course, the Conservative Party, who looks like it will get a beating, not only because it is perceived as not handling Brexit very well, but it's also seen a lot of defections. But then you also have the Labour Party, who apparently know, now they're saying that because of these elections coming up. It is exactly what actually Macron, uh, 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 why Macron was such a bad cop in these negotiations. He said this will take off the gun to the head of, of the negotiating team in the UK. And it's, and it's exactly what happened because the Labour said, well, we're not going to get anywhere with these conservative, uh, you know, with these two party talks. And that's because they're already gearing up to the election. Um, so, you know, it's going to be a, a really reshaping. So, so, so some of the people in the British election uh, survey team, they've been tweeting that these will be, you know, could change the European party system in the sense that, you know, this could tear uh, uh, parties apart. So like with what is the Conservative Party going into the in, into campaign? They wanted to go into the campaign, we delivered Brexit. Well, it looks like they won't be able to have delivered Brexit. So what are they going to say, right? And it's a little bit the same for the for 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 Labour, although they have more leeway because they're not in they're not in government. But it's not to say that there are no factions within the Labour Party. That there's some that want to have a referendum, some that want to have a customs union clear on, some that think that they should be negotiating uh, with uh, with the Conservatives, and other think that that's a bad idea. So it will probably, if we think about kind of what second order. So coming back to what we said at the beginning, so it's more likely for government parties to do badly. It's more likely for opposition parties to do better, for smaller parties to, to, to do better, with parties that take clear stances to do better, and turnout will be low. So if you get that kind of M image, it could be a quite of an anti-establishment uh, uh, kind of wave. The only exception could be that leavers are so extremely appalled by everything that happened that they're not going to the polls. And that actually the Remainers through all of this have been so enthusiastic about all of this, and they're going to make one of these, you, you know, Change UK, for example, or uh, or the Green, well, the Green Party, I don't think so, but you know, Change UK or something so big that they're going to have some, <laughs> it's going to have a signaling. But then, of course, these MEPs, you know, they're, they're, it looks like it's until the 31st of October. They're going to sit there for a little bit. They're not really allowed to vote on the budget. They're, you know, they're also going to be a little bit of lame ducks. So I don't think anyone is really happy with having these elections, except for these new parties that want to make their mark, the Brexit Party or, or Change UK, that think that this is a possibility for them to, you know, become poster childs of these elections and then to do better later on in, uh, in British elections. And actually, one thing that Change UK also has explicitly said. Um, is that they are that they want to do like Lib Dems previously? They want some form of PR in Britain, so they're also trying to do this, of course, for for national consumption, right? That they want to maybe ultimately feel that these parties might be losing a lot of ground, and that this might open up, um, you know, to a different type of system in the UK. But that's a lot of ifs, buts, and whens. Yeah. <laughs> I think we're in that that moment of uh, yeah of everything is if but when uh, with some, uh, ten different hypothetical scenarios. So uh, Andrea, do you want to? Well, I just I've been trying to wrap my head around uh, I don't know for the past couple of weeks like who's going to want to yeah, run in these elections? Somebody. Thinking about the actual people that want to be that MEP that goes there in October and and you know because some of my research has looked on this and sort of what is the role of that position within the British party system and none of it fits this time around. Um, you know, it used to be uh, if you were in the Conservative Party, you went to Europe to sort of show that you could be a good party member, you could run a campaign, and your future goal was to run, you know, for Westminster. But now I'm, I'm sitting there thinking, does anybody want that job? And who are these people going to be that decide that they're going to, I don't know, put, I wouldn't say sacrifice themselves for that job, but, or, or sort of what that's going to do uh, entirely to the party? I don't know. I can't mm -hmm. figure it out. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think I think we're all sort of trying to wrap our heads around around this and, and, yeah. and what so might, might happen. And, who actually ends up being candidates, I think. <laughs> yeah, well, and I think too that yeah, and we'll get back to the candidates in a, in, in a minute. Um, but I think just uh, sort of in, in, you know sort of in general, I think um, you know this I think will also change the nature of kind of who's voting, right? Too, and what they're voting about, right? And so this interestingly could really become another referendum <laughs> in some ways. Um, I mean, I think that's sort of what we're seeing since we are likely not to see another referendum in the UK, 
at least at the moment, um, but that in terms of what these elections, if they go through, uh, what they look like and what the outcome is, I mean, we, I think we can infer a lot from that in terms of what the electorate today, um, you know, what their preferences are three years on after the after the vote. So, um, it, yes, it, it'll be interesting to see what <laughs> what what transpires in the next five weeks in, in that in that perspective. Um, I wanted to um, kind of. Uh, step back and have sort of a couple of, 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 of final questions and then if there are other questions um, from those in the audience um, to, to think about and Andrew you mentioned this sort of who the candidates are not just in the UK but more generally um, and we've talked a lot about this idea of course of second order elections from the, you know and, and what we know from the literature but also from research but also sort of what we're seeing in practice now but you know how do the parties you know and and and, and, and Matthias of course uh, uh, can jump in as well on, on the far right and Catherine as well too but you know how do the parties view these elections right and how who are they selecting to actually send to to Brussels, right? Are these sort of individuals that are kind of at the, at the forefront of the party, and the or the or the upcoming leaders, or are these kind of the the has beens that, that the parties need to put somewhere? Um, kind of talk a bit about that and how that may vary um, from larger parties to smaller parties, uh, um, things like that. So, Andrew, do you want to start us off with that? Yeah, I mean, I, I was thinking about this over the last couple of days, and and these elections are sort of set up to be different. Uh, in a way that I think maybe some of the patterns we've seen in the past on, on who are candidates and how parties view these might change a little bit. Um, so typically we've seen in some of the older member states that either this is a place to put people who are maybe at the end of their career and to send them off, or it's a place to train some new people. Um, with the exception of some parties who are more policy oriented that might pick people who spend their careers in Europe. Um, in, in Germany in particular, my research uh, uh, has tend to show that there tend to be sets of politicians that are dedicated to working in Europe and the European Parliament, and then those that are that are more dedicated to working back home. Um, in Eastern Europe, it tend to be more uh, politicians who have already achieved some sort of level of success at home, and this is kind of the the next like good reward that they get in their career. Um, and that's certainly been the case um, in Croatia. But um, one of the things that leads me to think that this is changing is that they just released the list yesterday, or they just approved it yesterday, so I just got to see who's on the list. And um, it's not necessarily looking like that this time around, uh, particularly when it comes to the Conservative Party, which is the party that's in government right now. Um, so the former prime minister, or the prime minister right now of Croatia was a, an MEP from the first election uh, to the second election, um, and he was just elected in 2016 to be the prime minister. And instead of appointing people who are more well-known in Croatian politics. He's actually appointed quite a few young people who are um, loyal sort of aides of, of his and are not that well-known. Uh, and what's coming out in the analysis in the newspapers is that this is a way that he's combating this threat from the right. So the populist threat from the right has is really strong in Croatia and has generally been sort of taken over by the conservative party. In the last few elections, they've nominated one of the far-right candidates in coalition with themselves, and that far-right candidate has generally gotten enough preference votes to go and serve in the European Parliament. Um, but this time around, uh, the party leader has opted not to do that because the right faction of this party is uh, really sort of trying to push him out and put in a more conservative, more far-right leader. So it's an interesting dynamic that it appears as, as if the party has, he, at least the leader, because he has full control over selection, has seen how he can strategically try to sort of push the right out of his party uh, and be a little bit more mm -hmm. centrist. Uh, but this has meant that, that now the right is, has formed a coalition of their own and are putting forth some candidates that are well known to people who would normally support the right. So they will probably get a seat on their own. Um, but that's quite a different change. And I know they haven't been members long, but it's quite a different change than what we've seen in the past, which I think will mm -hmm. be interesting, at least for research, if nothing else. Mm -hmm. No, for sure. Matthias, um, perhaps you could talk a little bit about sort of uh, um, the, 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 the radical right parties and how they um, select who uh, are their, um, who are on their list, um, you know, who these individuals tend to be, you know, if they really see this as they're sort of in, in some respects, back into national politics, especially in some countries. Um, I'm not really sure about this, but I think that it, that it, that it strongly differs from case to case as well. I think that in mm -hmm. most countries, when it comes to most radical right parties, that they that they themselves also see these elections as second order elections, right? Mm -hmm. um, so they also think that 
um, well, the, 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 the first and, and most important place where politicians, where their politicians have to be is the national parliament. These are nationalist, par uh, nationalist parties, so the national par parliament is their main arena. Um, however, of course, they also, now maybe for some parties things are changing. Some parties that are successful now also try to, uh, to, to, to bring different parties together. And Catherine already talked about it. Matteo Salvini, for instance, in Italy, he is really doing well in the polls and he is uh, flirting with all these other radical right parties and he's trying to build a new group. He already is in, 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 in one of the most important radical right groups in the European Parliament, but the parties are spread out over uh, four of them, I would say. So he's trying to, 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 to build a stronger European party. So it might well be the case that if he succeeds, that these parties are also becoming more and more aware of the importance of the European political arena. But still, in the end, and this counts for, I think, for all parties, most parties are see European elections as secondary elections. Not only the populist radical right parties, who are, by definition, strongly nationalist, but also uh, all other parties. And I think that for, for that reason, um, like Andrea said, it's uh, either people who are new, they have to be trained, and Europe might be a good place to, to, to train uh, uh, ambitious and uh, talented politicians, or it is a place where people who have uh, uh, done a lot for the country, they could go to Europe to... Uh, uh, for instance, this is of course different if it's about a very important function, right? If it's about... Uh, uh, being a European uh, a com a commissioner, for instance, or if it's about uh, uh, something else, uh, a, a very important role, then um, it's not a secondary thing. But in general, my impression is, but I might be wrong here, that for most of these parties, but most, well, basically for all parties, uh, 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 these are really secondary. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to um, turn um, to something that we... Um, I think Catherine brought up uh, earlier, which is uh, the Spitzen candidate, uh, which was you know started in 2014, right? As, uh, and again, what this is is the, the leader uh, of the largest group uh, in, in, in the uh, elections. So whether it's the socialists or the uh, conservatives, right? That that individual then becomes the president of the commission. Um, so for the first time in 2014, right? We had uh, you know an EU-wide debate. Um, um, in which the, these individuals um, came together, took questions um, from a, an audience of, of, of generally sort of college-age students. Um, and I wonder, you know, this is happening again, although there's been obviously a lot of discussion about it for these elections. And, uh, um, you know, if we could talk a bit about sort of what the, kind of the purpose behind this was, um, if this is uh, doing uh, anything to kind of connect voters more to um, sort of the process more generally, where the commission president comes from, an understanding of the institutions, which we know that most Europeans are still somewhat, you know, uh, unclear about um, in, in some of these things, um, to kind of get your your sense of this. So, Catherine, do you want to maybe start us off? Sure, uh, sure. Talking about this? So, the the reasoning behind that is that there's been ongoing discussions about, um, and this is also, I mean, you can see this in a benevolent reading of this, is that the is that we're very concerned about democracy in the European Union or a less benevolent reading of this is that the European Parliament wants to become more important, right? So it's either some strategic reasoning or, or some, some, some real value to, to, this, to this procedure. But um, the idea was, well, uh, of the reasons that we've outlined, and we've all mentioned them, that these uh, uh, European parliamentary elections are seen as less important, as less at stake. And one of the reasons why that is is because there was no connection between what the outcome of the European parliamentary election was and how the, the composition of the, of the commission would look like, that both the president of the commission and all the commissioners will be put forward. There's one uh, leader among equals, and then there's every, every member state, so that looks like it will still be 28, um, uh, will have a commissioner. So Britain is not going to only enter the European parliamentary election, it also will get a, a lame duck commissioner uh, that's only going to sit for a little while and will get probably a quite nice pension. 
uh, coming over out of uh, out of the European Union. But anyway, uh, that's um, that's that idea was to make that link clearer, and that would be that you have the Spitzenkandidaten, so those are the heads of these European parliamentary groups, uh, of which there are many, uh, and uh, and then uh, uh, the 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 leader of the the group that would get the most votes would then become the Commission president, and then would put together a commission team. So that commission team is still really put forward by uh, by um, by um, uh, the council. So it's not necessarily that Juncker, because it was EPP, that the entire commission was people who were of that ideological leaning, but nonetheless, there was some link. So why is it controversial now is in the sense that, well, oh, well one of the other questions you asked, is this actually something that voters uh, connect to? Well, first of all, this is, a, this is a name that only EU scholars and Germans can properly pronounce. So it also already has led that this is the word that Germans use for their uh, leading candidates. So actually, when we polled, so we've done that with this uh, opinions that we that you talked about with the Bertelsmann Foundation, German Foundation, we polled about how many people have heard about Spitzenkandidaten. So that's about 83% of Germans. Also, one of the last Spitzenkandidaten, of course, Martin Schulz, the guy from the Social Democrats, or the, the person, sorry, it's the wrong, I didn't mean that in the wrong way, uh, the, the leader of the, of the Social Democrats was a German. And uh, and um, and uh, for the rest of, of Europe, a Spitzenkandidat, and I think there was like three percent of Spanish people that have heard uh, heard of it. Uh, no one really looked at these debates. Uh, these these elections, as I said at the beginning, are not transnational elections, right? They're elections within uh, a national member states. So that maybe hasn't really uh, happened. So what is going to be in really interesting for EU scholars like myself, who are like junks of what comes out of out of Brussels in terms of the news, is that this is a quite controversial time for the Spitzenkandidat. Why? So Manfred Weber, uh, who is the leader of the European People's Party, which I, we don't know because the European People's Party, the Conservative Party, will get a beating also in these elections. They are not looking good for the reasons that Matthijs outlined and Andrea outlined in terms of that these government parties don't do, look well and then right-wing populist parties are doing pre pre pretty well. But if, if the polling, the polls of polls are correct, they would be the largest... Uh, um, member, but he is a he is a member of the CSU, so of the kind of more conservative part of the co of the coalition between the two Christian Democratic parties in Germany, um, of which there are tensions between Merkel and the previous leader of that. He's also German, which is something that is not necessarily seen as preferable uh, because it's also because of the reasons you outlined. It's it's the biggest country; it has a lot of influence anyway. So then it will be a commission president that is German. So there's some rumors that actually, that actually, one of the reasons that Macron was pushing for getting the Brexit thing over is because he wants to put Barnier in. Barnier has never, he said he was not running as a, as a Spitzenkandidat, and he's never ruled out becoming the, the president of the commission. He's an EPP member, or he would, he would be a member of the EPP. So we will have to see what happens there. But there, there are some people who suggest this. It's just pure speculation on which people are, are betting and so on. Uh, that, uh, that actually Manfred Weber will not become uh, the commission president because of the fragmented you know, parliament that we're going to see. So these populist right party groups are not probably going to support him, but he's also not popular because he's so conservative among the Greens. And one of the reasons that he's not supportive among the Liberals and the Greens is that he's actually been quite supportive of Fidesz membership, so the, the party of, uh, of Orban within the EPP. So there's a whole lot of kind of strategic playing has the Spitzenkandidaten changed a lot? So, well, yes, as the commission president now for the last time came, the question is, will that be, you know, in the future? But probably for ordinary voters, this has not really increased their, their ideas that the EU is more democratic or more legitimate in their eyes. At least there's no, there's no survey evidence to suggest that that's the type of, of mechanisms we see. So it's a very intra-EU mm -hmm. type of discussion uh, rather mm -hmm. than, a, than a more popular one. So I think perhaps, you know, the name is just, it needs to be changed. That might help a bit. <laughs> Matthias, do you want to jump in? Yeah. Yeah, so I think the fact that, that what is really interesting is, is that Weber is so controversial. That's really interesting that many people who would support the whole process, the procedure of having Spitzenkandidaten, they're really in favor of that, but they're really not in favor of him being the next leader yeah. of the of the commission. So that is really interesting. What's also really interesting is that uh, that Macron is not really in favor of the whole process. Uh, and I think that's also, he, he of course, also is a very important uh, uh, um, voice when, when, it, when, it, when, it, when it comes to the, 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 the Spitzenkandidaten thing. And um, 
Um, so I'm really, I mean, also the fact, I think the Liberals have six Spitzenkandidaten, or uh, a couple of them. So I'm really curious about whether... And the Greens have two, this I think. Really, what? The Greens have two, yeah. The Greens have two? The Greens have two, two yeah. Ex yeah, exactly. So I'm not really sure. And, and, and the final thing I wanted to say is that, of course, the whole idea was that the Spitzenkandidat process would make the, co the, 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 the European Commission more um, uh, a, a thing of the European people, uh, a thing of the, 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 the demos, so to say. But of course, Juncker was the one who was uh, who was the, who, who, who became the leader of the Commission, and I think he is in many many countries the most uh, uh, clear example of a technocratic uh, bureaucrat in Brussels. So I'm not really sure of the uh, the goal that people had with the whole process if that really worked out well. So I'm not. I think that many people are not really in favor anymore of this whole idea. And Macron, in fact, he is, of course, in favor of more European democracy. He just says we really have to have European elections. And as Catherine said, we don't have them. It's national elections. Uh, the, and the European Parliament European voted parties. that down, right? So. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you to everyone. This has been a really great conversation, which, of course, we could keep, we could continue for uh, uh, another hour or so, which we're not, don't worry. Um, but but uh, I think um, we covered a lot of uh, of important questions and territory, and I wonder if we could just kind of do a round of, you know, any what your takeaways are and and, and predictions for the for the election um, coming up uh, in the next few weeks. Um, Andrew, do you want to want to start? Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm not sure that I have any predictions per se, but I think um, whatever happens, I would expect maybe turn out to remain about about the same, but it's going to be just totally different. Um, I think if we do see a lot of these. Uh, right-wing populist parties winning seats, obviously that's going to change the way um, that sort of our current understanding of how the European Parliament works and kind of what the role is of an MEP uh, within national politics itself is, is going to change a little bit. So I think it's really um, going to be something that's interesting to watch, to keep an eye on, um, and maybe give us, uh, you know, kind of a new hat in which to wear when we think about sort of what's going on in Europe, Europe and the EP. Matthias? Yeah, I think the main stories are going to be about the, 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 the further, the, the next earthquake of, and, and when it comes to the far right. And of course, uh, if Britain will, or the UK will participate in the elections, and I think they will because uh, I don't think that there is going to happen, happen anything uh, before that, it will be about the chaos uh, <laughs> in, in the UK <laughs> uh, because of their participation. But I think that the most important thing here is uh, what mainstream parties are going to do. I mean, they're going to lose again. How are they going to deal with uh, the challenges that come from the radical right? What are they going to do? Uh, they're still struggling here and they will keep on struggling, I think. And that will be one of the most important issues for them and for European politics in general. Yeah, no, I, I think it will be, I mean, it's, it's, it's still, you know, it, it is one, one kind of small thing of caution that it's very difficult to poll. European parliamentary elections because of the turnout issues that Andrea was talking about, that we just don't know who will eventually turn out. So, and, and then we also know that there is potentially a bias against right-wing populist parties in that turnout, i.e. that some of these people really don't like the EU or are not particularly interested, so they don't go and vote. But nonetheless, I also think that most of the polling that we're seeing that was pretty on last year, uh, sorry, last, last, uh, last time, uh, that, that, that populist right parties will do well. So in this country, for example, where I'm now in the Netherlands, that, that Forum for Democracy is, is, is predicted. So this new far-right Eurosceptic type party, anti-immigration, uh, that, that, that uh, Matthijs also has, uh, has already discussed, is going to be the largest party. You see that in, in many other countries that that's being predicted, the Lega, for example, in, uh, in, uh, in, in Italy. So we're seeing a lot of that. Also, uh, very importantly, I think uh, Vox in Spain, which is uh, going to go and get a breakthrough, uh, perhaps, uh, but we don't know because 28th of April are first national election, so we have to wait how they do. Um, but it's it's going to be difficult, and I actually do think that it might be. A, a, I think what we really will see is what some people have called the Dutchification of kind of uh, election results, because here you have such permissive electoral systems, right? So they, they these things come through is a huge fragmentation. You're going to see not these two big blocks, the EPP and the 
and and uh, and the pair and then the part of European socials, it's going to be really much more fragmented. And then these things that that we were talking about, what did the Greens really like, and what did the far right, and are they going to cooperate? Are going to be crucial. And I think also this time around, it's going to be really important because I think the 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 questions that lie ahead for this commission. So this Parliament then has to decide on a commission. And, and that's what the questions that lie ahead. If Britain really leaves, there's going to be a new multiple year frame, financial framework, which m might you know, have huge ramifications. There's going to be money going from the east to the south. And then there's, there's going to be an increase for net contributors. So there's a lot of important things that will follow from this election into European po politics at a time where you know, Europe might not need a lot of that fragmentation. But I think one last thing I want to say about it is that you know, we can see this as a dangerous thing for the EU, and that maybe is a, what a technocratic position will, will be. And then on the other hand, we also see much more debate and much more participation. It's maybe not the type of things that the EU would like to see, but those people who wanted to see the debate, well, you have it now. Uh, and now the question <laughs> indeed will be is how do, how do more, more pro-EU parties or mainstream parties respond uh, uh, to this? And, uh, and that will be a kind of a key question, not just in European parliamentary election, but in many national elections that we will see in the years to come. Well, thank you. Thank you all. Um, I think we have lots lots to, to, to think about and, and there's a lot to, to sort of pay attention to over the next few weeks. And I think we can all agree this is a very exciting time in, 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 in European elections and European um, politics more generally. And I think we're seeing this all play out right now. So um, thank you again to, um, to uh, the three of you for joining us and to our audience members. And um, have a good afternoon, everyone.